Hi there, this is Robin Norgren, and I'm your host for Creativity, Montessori, and the Meaning of Life. You can find all the work that I do on my links on Instagram under Robin underscore Norgren or at UBU for Life. I'd like to start first with some words from Your Story is Your Power by L. Luna and Susie Herrick. The most powerful person in the world is the storyteller. The storyteller sets the vision, values, and agenda of an entire generation that is to come. Steve Jobs. Stories live inside you and shape your life, but why? What were the earliest stories you heard that hooked you? What compelled you to want to hear them again and again? What inspired you to share them with others? Perhaps even your own children. Passing those stories on throughout time. Giving the stories life. The most endearing tales tap into something larger than mere entertainment. They literally help us evolve. We warm our hands on stories, both historical and imagined all the while taking in essential information. The sharing of fairy tales from generation to generation is the most enduring methods for creating and sustaining culture. What does that mean for us? For women, many of our early collective education resides in these tales. It is as though each of us is given a recipe that shares that shows us what to do to create a successful life as well as how to behave to get that life. The characters, attributes, and themes of these well-known tales socialize us from a very young age, shaping our earliest ideas of who we are, what our culture values in us, and who we feel we ought to become if we want to find our own happily ever after. As women throughout time grapple with the directives for happily ever after, we watch the story, we learn from the story, and unless challenged, we will in time live the story. So what's the story? For girls, the earliest and oldest story is often a fairy tale. What young girl or woman today isn't intimately familiar with Cinderella, Beauty and the Beast, Snow White? In the classic fairy tale Cinderella, a beloved daughter is orphaned, adopted, and turned into an indentured servant, while everyone else gets to go to the ball. With the help of a fairy godmother, a dress, and a famous pair of shoes, Cinderella goes to the ball and is so beautiful that the handsome young prince falls in love with her. Despite the jealousy of her stepmother and stepsisters, Cinderella gets the prince, becomes a princess, and is lifted out of her painful life of manual labor. Another classic is Beauty and the Beast. The main character, Belle, beautiful in French, is also a beauty. She finds herself a hor in a horrible situation. Her beloved father is imprisoned by the cruel, arrogant beast, so she sacrifices herself and becomes the beast's prisoner in exchange for her father's release. Beast frightens Belle and is cruel to her, but he develops feelings for her. Trapped in an abusive relationship, Belle uses her beauty, sexuality, and submissive spirit to turn Beast into a kinder man, whom she eventually falls in love. Finally, Snow White. Like the other women, Snow White is slim, demure, and physically attractive. But her beauty makes her stepmother jealous. This conflict creates the central part of the story. Multiple attempts are made to murder the girl, asphyxiating her with a corset, putting out a bounty on her head, finally a po poisoning an apple, of which Snow White takes a bite. Ultimately, a handsome young man, who also happens to be a prince, falls in love with the girl because, once again, she is beautiful. He kisses her while she is unconscious, obviously without her consent, and turns her back to life. When culture's most popular stories demote women to beautiful housekeepers, what does a young girl begin to feel 
society values in her. With the main plots, plot points laid out plainly, we can't help but wonder why these foundational stories are centered on a woman who has no capacity to take care of herself and needs a prince to come take care of her. As women, do we see that these fairy tales are a part of the brainwashing of women? Do we call the bluff? Do we write our own children's books or craft our own nursery rhymes? As girls, are we simply too young to know any better? Do we begin to believe that we need to strive to be like Cinderella? Do we get carried away along in fun songs and the parts that we like, that we do like, all the while sweeping the stories that don't seem quite right under the rug? We might not like to think we're susceptible to conditioning from something as innocent as a fairy tale, but children learn from everything, especially stories that are intriguing or entertaining. In Henry Nouwen's book, Spiritual Direction, he says, The tale often told about Michelangelo forming a statue speaks of how spiritual formation takes place in the heart. The Lion in the Marble There was once a sculptor who worked hard with hammer and chisel on a large block of marble. A little child who was watching him saw nothing more than large and small pieces of stone falling away left and right. He had no idea what was happening. But when the boy returned to the studio a few weeks later, he saw to his surprise a large, powerful lion sitting in the place where the marble had stood. With great excitement, the boy ran to the sculptor and said, Sir, tell me, how did you know there was a lion in the marble? The little boy's question to the sculptor is a very real one, perhaps the most important question of all. The answer is, I knew there was a lion in the marble, because I fo before I saw the lion in the marble, I saw, the, I saw him in my heart. The secret is that it was the lion in my heart that recognized the lion in the marble. The art of sculpture is, first of all, the art of seeing. And discipline is the way to make visible what has been seen. Spiritual disciplines are the skills and techniques by which we begin to see the image of God in our heart. Spiritual formation is the careful attentiveness to the work of God, our master sculptor, as we submit to the gradual chipping away of all that is not of God until the inner lion is revealed. Spiritual direction is the interaction between the little child, the master sculptor, and the emerging beautiful marble lion. Any director is really an onlooker who cheers and marvels as the artistry unfolds. Living a spiritual life is far from easy. Marble doesn't give away easily, and neither does the human spirit conform quickly to God's design. Being formed in God's likeness involves the struggle to move from absurd, absurd living to obedient listening. The word absurd includes the word sardis, which means deaf. Absurd living is a way of life in which we remain deaf to the voices that speak to us in our silence. The many activities in which we are involved, the many concerns that keep us preoccupied, and the many sounds that surround us make it very hard for us to hear the sheer silence through which God's presence is made known. It seems that the noisy, busy world conspires against our, our hearing that voice and tries to make us absolutely deaf. It therefore is not surprising when we often wonder in the midst of our very occupied and preoccupied lives if anything is truly happening. Our lives may be filled with many events, so many events that we often wonder how we can get them all done. At the same time, we may feel unfulfilled and wonder if being busy but bored involved yet lonely is a symptom of the absurd life, the life in which we no longer hear the voice of the one who created us and who calls us to a new life. 
This absurd life is extremely painful because it makes us feel as if we are living in exile, cut off from the vital source of our existence. The obedient life develops our abilities to hear and sense God's presence and activities. The word obedience includes the word adir, which means listening. The obedient life is one in which we listen with great attention to God's spirit within and among us. The great news of God's revelation is not simply that God exists, but also that God is actively present. Our God is the God who cares, heals, guides, directs, challenges, confronts, corrects, and forms us. God is a God who wants to lead us closer to the fuller realization of our lion-hearted humanity, if you will. To be obedient means to con be constantly attentive to this active presence and to allow God, who is only love, to be the one source as well as the goal of all that we think, say, and do. In Austin Kleon's book, Steal Like an Artist, Choose What to Leave Out. In this age of information abundance and overload, those who get ahead will be the folks who figure out what to leave out so they can concentrate on what's really important to them. Nothing is more paralyzing than the idea of limitless possibilities. The idea you can do anything is absolutely terrifying. The way to get over creative block is to simply place some constraints on yourself. It seems contradictory, but when it comes to creative work, limitations mean freedom. Write a song on your lunch break. Paint a painting with only one color. Start a business without any startup capital. Shoot a movie with your iPhone and a few of your friends. Build a machine out of spare parts. Don't make excuses for not working. Make things with the time, space, and materials you have right now. The right constraints can lead to your very best work. My favorite example? Dr. Seuss wrote The Cat in the Hat with only 236 different words. So his editor bet him he couldn't write a book with only 50 different words. Dr. Seuss came back and won the bet with Green Eggs and Ham, one of the best-selling children's books of all time. Jack White says, Telling yourself you have all the time in the world, all the money in the world, all the colors in the palette, anything you want, that just kills your creativity. The artist Saul Steinberg says, What we respond to in any work of art is the artist's struggle against his or her limitations. It's often what an artist chooses to leave out that makes the art interesting. What isn't shown versus what is. It's the same for people. What makes us interesting isn't just what we've experienced, but also what we haven't experienced. The same is true when you do your work. You must embrace your limitations and keep going. In the end, creativity isn't just the things we chose to put in. It's the things we chose to leave out. Choose wisely and have fun.